Absolutely excited about this evening. I mean, you can you can feel the energy here, right? I mean, there's just it's a wonderful evening ahead of us. Thank you all for coming here today. Um, as you know, our speaker today is uh, Blizzard Entertainment's president and CEO, uh, Mike Morheim, and he's going to be the first speaker of our uh, Ronald and Valerie Sugar uh, Distinguished Speaker Series uh, for this year. Uh, before we kick this off, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the series. Now, this is a series that's been, uh, so, so if those of you who don't know, uh, Ron Sugar is a graduate of our school. Uh, he used to be the CEO of Northrop Grumman Corporation. He's an electrical engineering PhD out of our school, and I believe actually an undergraduate out of our school as well. Uh, and so uh, he uh, endowed uh, this speaker series, he and his wife, uh, to bring in uh, industry leaders of all kinds to campus so as to expose our students uh, to their experience uh, being leaders, of course, of, en of engineering industries, large industries, but also people who have uh, entrepreneurial experience, have started companies, have led successful companies, and so on. And I will tell you, we've done about a year of this, and it's been enormously successful. Our students have loved it. I know that I've loved it. And so we're now embarking on the second year uh, of uh, the Ron and Valerie Sugar uh, speaker series. Now, uh, before we uh, kick this off, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, UCLA Engineering for those of you uh, who uh, haven't heard. Uh, UCLA uh, has been ranked the number one public university in a number of recent uh, uh, world rankings and U.S. rankings. Uh, we beat uh, Berkeley, which is really all I care about <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Yay. All right, and so all of you should be enormously proud to be a part of that enterprise. Uh, I don't have to tell you how good you guys are. Our students are absolutely amazing. Uh, this year, we had 24,000 applicants into UCLA Engineering, a quarter of all the applicants to UCLA. We take 775, and so those of you who were chosen to come here are absolutely amazing students. Our median uh, SAT score this year is 1480 out of 1600. That's a median. Half the class is better than that. Uh, we've got a median entering GPA of 4.0, believe it or not. Uh, median ACT math score of 34 out of 36. So we are admitting extraordinarily good students, and so you all should be absolutely proud of your excellence. Um, as many of you know, uh, the school is growing. We are currently 174 faculty. We're going to be adding 50 more. Uh, we'll probably have another 50 or so retire over the next five to 10 years. So we're really talking about a school that's in the process of radical transformation. We're going to be hiring 100 new faculty over the next five to 10 years. 100 is half the size of the school. All right. So they're going to be, uh, there's going to be a huge change sweeping through the school. We're going to be hiring in a lot of cut cutting edge areas. Uh, and so all of this will flow down into graduate and undergraduate education, uh, research and training, and so I'm absolutely excited about that. Uh, many of you know that we're going to get a new building really soon, Engineering 6. They're going to hand us the keys to it a week from today, and uh, CS is going to move into Engineering 6 uh, over uh, winter break. Uh, that's going to empty out uh, big chunks of Bolter Hall, which we will then refurbish and then hire a lot of new people to put into all of those rooms. So I'm absolutely excited about everything that's shaping up uh, for our school. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Mike Morheim. Uh, tonight, Mike has come full circle. Uh, when he was in school here, uh, Mike, uh, I understand, can remember coming to special events such as these, and now he is the star attraction. And, and, you know, and in that statement really lies uh, a whole big story, right? A story of hard work, of imagination, of success, of building a business, employing people, uh, and having a big impact on the world. And that's really uh, what Michael Morheim is all about. 
Um, so he is, as I said, uh, the president and CEO, co-founder of Blizzard Entertainment, one of the world's premier developers and publishers of entertainment software. Uh, Mike got his B BS in electrical engineering from UCLA in 1990. Um, and if you've ever played uh, any Blizzard game uh, over the last few decades, uh, Michael has had a big role in it in one form or another. Um, now, one of the wonderful things about UCLA engineering is that you are surrounded by smart people. And that was true, of course, when Michael was going to school here as well. And so uh, in 1991, uh, Mike co-founded Blizzard Entertainment with fellow UCLA engineering alums, uh, Alan Adam and uh, Frank Pierce. Uh, under Mike's direction, uh, first as a company vice president and then as president since 1998, uh, Blizzard has grown from a third party uh, development studio into a premier publisher of entertainment software. Uh, over the past decade, Mike has also overseen Blizzard's transformation into a global enterprise. Uh, the company now has multiple offices uh, in North America, of course, but in Asia, in Europe, in Latin America, and it has, what, 5,000 employees worldwide? Uh, so it's a huge, big enterprise today. Uh, aside from leadership roles, uh, Mike was a programmer or a producer on several of Blizzard's biggest games, and he was uh, an executive producer on the world of Warcraft, which I'm sure every one of you knows about. Uh, truly a wonderful example of how a UCLA engineering education works. Uh, Michael has coupled his, fun his engineering education with big ideas, uh, great creativity, a fantastic work ethic, and he's really built something remarkable. So it's wonderful to have you here, Michael. Uh, our moderator this evening is computer science professor Jens Paulsberg, whom many of you, I'm sure, know. Uh, Jens joined uh, UCLA uh, faculty in 2003, uh, previously from Purdue. I didn't know that, so you and I have that in common. Wonderful. Now, he's had many honors. And these include the uh, much coveted NSF Career Award, and he's been an ACM distinguished speaker. Uh, his research interests include compilers, embedded systems, programming languages, software engineering, and information security. And he teaches undergraduate classes on compiler construction. Uh, now, uh, Jens was also the chair of the CS department from 2010 and 2015. And uh, he got his, computer, uh, his PhD in computer science uh, from the University of Aarhus in Denmark. Now, his stint as CS department chair, I believe, uh, led him to abandon that and head off and get an MBA from <laughs> UCLA Anderson. So that's a really interesting combination of uh, skills. Uh, and so uh, and I'm, gl I'm really glad to see that mixture. That's quite uh, the role model. And so in any case, I think we've got a wonderful pair here. Uh, Michael Morheim to be interviewed by Jens Paulsberg. So uh, welcome, and let's get started. Hey, everybody. You get to ask questions, too. I, I have prepared a couple of questions for free, and, uh, and then we'll have microphones. And so just think about what you want to ask. But, uh, but before we begin, I, I want to ask you, what, how did you get to program? How did I start programming? Yeah. <laughs> um, so for me, uh, it goes back to uh, when I was in sixth grade. Um, we, uh, so this is back when uh, the Atari 2600 was very popular. My parents uh, basically let us shop around and choose a video game platform and save up money. I, I chose the Bally Professional Arcade platform which was a higher-end arcade system. Um, most people don't know anything about it now, but um, it had a little bit better games, had a more powerful processor, and they had a basic cartridge you could buy for it. And um, so I bought the basic cartridge, read the manual, and that was my first exposure to programming. I thought it was the most amazing thing ever. Um, and then actually, um, in the mail, I got a solicitation for this newsletter that some guy, power user up in San Francisco was putting out. Um, he called it the Arcadian. And he basically published 
uh, programs for the Ballet Professional Arcade. So you could type in your basic programs. And so I would, uh, I would just look forward to receiving the newsletter every month. And I would type in the programs. I'd debug them. I'd save them off at 300 baud to my little cassette deck thing. Um, anyway, it's like really primitive. We had 1.5K of RAM to work with. <laughs> <laughs> and you made it happen. Yeah, it was awesome. I loved it. <laughs> um, what attracted you into to gaming? So programming is one thing, but gaming? Yeah, um, so, so I studied double E here at UCLA. Um, and th as I went through my, uh, my education, I found that I was really drawn to digital circuit design and computer architecture and computers in general. I just love learning about how computers work and um, how to sort of low-level programming with computers. Um, and then gradually, um, higher level languages. I took mm -hmm. a class in C. Mm -hmm. um, I became very good friends with uh, another fellow student, uh, Alan Adham, who was studying CS and E. And um, Alan graduated six months after me. Uh, when I graduated, I got a job with Western Digital down in Irvine. Um, and Alan, um, Alan had his sort of, he had it all planned out. He was going to start up a game company. And he set out to sort of convince me to leave my job at Western Digital and go into business with him making games. Up until meeting Alan, I never considered a career in game making. Um, when Alan approached me about this idea, um, my, actually my response was no. I, I don't know anything <laughs> about how to do that. And, um, but Al Alan was very persistent. He said, um, look, we're both smart. Um, we can figure out. If we put our minds together, we can figure it out anything. Um, I can teach you what you need to know. It's not rocket science. Um, and so eventually, I kind of gave in, and we started the company. How did you two meet to begin with? <laughs> so um, my last year at UCLA, um, we had two classes together. Actually, this is sort of this is a, a funny story. So um, we were sort of acquaintances um, in these two classes. But there was one day. Um, we were in the com computer lab together, um, actually in Belter Hall. So we were in one of the computer labs. And um, we had these X Windows terminals. And um, you could, so Alan went to print something from his project, and he locked his terminal. And the way that the, the terminals work, you could only actually lock them for 10 minutes, and they unlocked. So, he locked it. He left. He was gone longer than 10 minutes. And I'm sitting alone in the computer lab with, you know, I noticed that it timed out and it's unlocked. So I did what every single one of you would have done. <laughs> I went over to the, to the terminal and I relocked it. I wanted to pick a password that I'd never used before that I could remember because it would be embarrassing if I couldn't remember it. But um, first thing that popped into my mind was Joe, all lowercase. And so I, you know, and then I went back to work. So Alan comes back into the room, and um, he sits down at the terminal, types in his password, and it unlocks. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> right. So I look over. I'm like, wait, how did you do that? And he said, do what? I said, how did you unlock it? He said, I typed my password in. I said, what was your password? He said. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I said, was it Joe? <laughs> and he's like, how did you know that? <laughs> so we laughed for like a half an hour. We just could not stop laughing. What are the odds of that happening? You know, and we just became very good friends after that. Do you have, do you have um, career goals that, that initially were in a different direction before you and Alan joined up? You know, my, uh, my career goals, at that time, I didn't really have a career goal other than I just wanted to learn how stuff worked. It was all magical to me. Um, and um, I was just fascinated by everything, you know, uh, computers, cars, uh, never really learned how they worked, but um, <laughs> television, radio, like, just all the electronical stuff, it seemed to me that it, 
had to be um, there had to be some logic to it, you know, with building blocks that was kind of like programming. But before becoming studying electrical engineering, nothing told me any of those building blocks. Like they just don't teach you this stuff in school. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they do now, but they certainly didn't before. Mm -hmm. So I was just fascinated, um, and I just wanted to to kind of absorb and, and soak up information. And I gradually got more and more interested in digital circuit design, uh, architecture, microprogramming, assembly language. Um, the, what ended up winding me at Blizzard is sort of, um, I think, some of that curiosity, really, and my friendship with Alan. And so I'll just share a couple of quick stories with you guys. Um, I did an internship. Um, in my last year um, at a company called SMOS, I was working on, um, they were working on a 40, uh, they were working on a microprocessor, a 46 clone processor, and I was working on um, their floating point multiplier system, um, just doing some digital circuit design. And um, while I was there, a good friend of mine was taking an AI class. Um, and I just decided, actually not me, not only me, but all of our little group of friends decided we just tag along with her and audit the class. And um, it was interesting, you know, mm -hmm. learning about how simple AIs worked and min-max trees and all that stuff. And okay, that was fun. And then when I came back to school, I took. Um, I was interested in it, and I was interested in um, learning C. I never got to take any C classes. I thought it would be good to learn C. Mm -hmm. And so I took PIC 10C. And the final project was to write the AI for a checkers program. And um, the way that they did it is we all wrote our, our AIs, and then they had all the checkers programs play against each other in this big tournament, which is really cool. Um, and so I actually applied a bunch of the stuff that I learned from my, um, that AI class that I had audited. Um, and then I had some bugs with my program. And I uh, went to my friend Alan for help. So he gave me some tips on troubleshooting it. Fast forward to later on, I graduated six months before him. I'm kind of showing off my checkers program, which is all ASCII text. And Alan says, you know, it'd be really easy to add keyboard or uh, mouse and graphic support to that. So the next time we got together, I had it running and it, you know, had added mouse support and graphic support and ported it over to the PC so it ran there. And I think that kind of um, positioned me as being like a guy who is like a real self-starter, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. really, um, you know, he already knew I was pretty smart because one of our classes that we had together was uh, computer architecture, where one of the things they were teaching us about was floating point multiplier units, which turns out that I knew a little bit about because we were working on one. So I was like the guy asking questions in the class, and so I think those things, you know. Um, positioned me as like one of the smartest kids in the class, or so it seemed, um, and a uh, real self-starter, interested and passionate about gaming. And so Alan uh, kind of had me in pole position to be his partner in starting this new game company, long story short. Mm -hmm. so, so then moving on to, to talk about the game company. Um, so it's, it's a large company now. How many? We have about 5,000. 5,000 worldwide. Yeah. What do you do to, to help make that a great place to work? Um, uh, well, first is having a, a goal and a commitment to, yeah. to making our company a great place to work. Yeah. Um, we have, so with our games, you know, we, we try to make our games um, uh, as great as, as they can be. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge commitment um, on the part of everybody at Blizzard to do that. We use a very iterative process to do that. In other words, um, the games get better as we go. We play them, we make them better. We apply the same process to the company um, mm -hmm. in terms of constantly um, refining, soliciting feedback, improving how we do things. Uh, obviously, you have to evolve a lot when you go from three people to 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. And so the, we're constantly iterating on organizational structure, on processes, on uh, how we communicate between different offices together. <laughs> and so. Mm -hmm. um, we put in place a number of different uh, ways for the for us to kind of take the temperature on how we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, we have a two, every two years we have a employee opinion survey, where we 
solicit feedback from, from everybody at the company and then actually go around and I meet and talk to folks at all levels of the company in every department and every office to also get firsthand uh, uh, feedback. You know, and then we meet as a leadership team and kind of apply the feedback to look at the, identify the areas where we need to improve as an organization. Keep improving. Continue That's right, always improving. improving and always also improving. always listening. Yeah. Listening. Um, so that, that brings me to another thing. So uh, your company surely has programmers. How about on the creative side? Where do you go to get creative inspiration? What, what are the kind of people you bring in? Well, so when we're hiring people, and this really applies to a any position at Blizzard, um, whether it's game development or even non-game non development, we're looking for passionate people yeah. that want to be part of something special. Um, so we're looking, you know, it's uh, everybody at Blizzard contributes to making our games great, yeah. you know, and so it really helps when somebody is passionate about gaming yeah. in general mm -hmm. uh, because they apply that to helping us make our games great. Mm -hmm. um, what we found is that it's not enough to have a great development team that's working on a, a game. They actually can't do it alone um, because they need feedback from people who weren't um, involved in the creation of the thing. You know, and so um, they know all the reasons why they chose the path that they chose and all the reasons why, um, uh, you know, this is what you have to do in the first level and everything like that. But when you have people who weren't involved in that, that are also passionate playing and providing feedback to the game team, I think that's where the magic really, really happens. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually that's not even enough. And so we have to put our games out to the public and help them beta test and we right. get even more feedback. Right. So it's all very iterative the whole way. Right. But it starts with passionate people. Yes. I have to ask you one thing. I read Lord of the Rings 14 times. Does, does, that, does that book series uh, sort of play into the inspiration for some of the games of Blizzard? There's uh, definitely a huge um, base of fantasy and science fiction uh, mm -hmm. lovers at Blizzard. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read Lord of the Rings 14 times, but, <laughs> but there's that scene, you know, where all, they're all sort of forming the fellowship. Yeah. I must have listened to the audio oh. version of that at least 50 times. Yeah. Because it is so dense yes. and packed. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Every time I get in my car, I just start over. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so let's go back to uh, when World of Warcraft uh, came out. And you decided on this uh, model of $15 and many new things coming out all at the same time with World of Warcraft. How, how did you get the inspiration to, to try all those new things all in one go? And how, and how did it work out as you see it? Other uh, than we know it was Yeah, World, World of Warcraft was really an evolution. Yeah. So when we first started working on World of Warcraft, um, we had a very different ideas of what we were trying to do. Um, it actually started out kind of an, as an ev evolution of Diablo II. Oh. And so we thought we would um, use a similar business model. Mm -hmm. We would have... Uh, single player, the ability to sort of play mm -hmm. uh, through the game like single player. You didn't have to actually go online and play with other people. But we also wanted to have massively multiplayer game, kind of like EverQuest. And, um, and then as we had headed down that path, we ran into a bunch of reality, mm -hmm. which is those are two different games. <laughs> um, and you kind of, which one are you trying to make? And we said, well, definitely the massively multiplayer one is the more important one, and so let's focus on that. Mm -hmm. And then um, we realized that, okay, well, if we're going to make the best massively multiplayer game in the world, we're going to need to support this thing for a long time with content after we release the game. Um, then we're going to need to charge a subscription fee like EverQuest, because otherwise they're going to be able to afford a much larger team mm -hmm. to develop content for their game. Well, shoot, if, we have, if we're charging a subscription fee of $15, we're going to need a huge customer service staff to support all these paying customers that are paying us. And so it kind of just evolved um, into what it was based on what the game needed and required to be great. You have managed to make, make your company's games transcend across the world, many different countries and cultures. 
What, what do you do to actively make this happen, this, this success everywhere? Um, so again, that's, that's another evolution of the company. When we first started out, uh, our primary market was the United States. That was the biggest game market in the world. Um, and um, we did localize our game into other languages, but it was sort of like you release in the United States and Canada, and then gradually over time you'd get around to localizing the game. And then around the year 2000 when we launched um, Diablo 2, our uh, European team basically made the case to us that, hey, um, if you treat Europe like a first class citizen, then you will <laughs> sort of, you know, um, you will actually get um, retail, the retailers, to really get behind the game as it is. All of the hardcore players basically buy gray market imports of the United States version. And so when you get around to releasing it in German and French, the hardcore players have already bought the game. And so there's not really a big launch. And so let's do a simultaneous launch of this new game, Diablo 2, release it at the same time everywhere. Problem was, that meant we would had to actually finish the game <laughs> and sit on it for a couple of months while we localized it into these other languages which, really, you want us to finish the game and not actually release it? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, but we did it, and it really worked, because we were able to make a much bigger event out of the launch. Um, and actually, what we found out was, um, even a little bit before that with StarCraft uh, in 1998, StarCraft um, wasn't ever designed uh, for some of the more complicated character sets. It's actually, it actually uses an 8 bit, um, uh, eight bits for characters. So you can't do the multi-byte character sets like the Asian languages mm -hmm. with, uh, with StarCraft. Mm -hmm. But even so, StarCraft totally took off in Korea. It became like the most popular game there. They were playing it in English. Um, but, but it's still really, really popular. And so thereafter, we always um, thought about um, not just the European languages, but we also thought about Korean as a really big market. Mm -hmm. And then China started to become a really big market. And so now the way we've evolved today is our games are released simultaneously everywhere in about 12 languages. How much of a delay does that introduce now and compared to? I think that, um, you know, uh, in, in order to really get a big launch out of a game, you have to lock down a release date a couple months in advance. I think uh, our marketing team likes 60 days. And so we're localizing the games as we go. And um, so I wouldn't say it's necessarily the global launch that's slowing thing, things up. I would say that um, we need to be pretty sure about mm -hmm. when we're going to launch the game. And then once we're sure, we'll lock in the date. And that's usually two months ahead of time, maybe sometimes more. Yeah. Um, we're getting a little bit better at it. We are, we are talking about, in, a, in many ways, your transition from starting as an engineer yeah. from UCLA and then becoming a businessman. How, how do you think of this transition, and how did, you, how did you enjoy the ride? Well, it's been a crazy, amazing ride. Um, it's been a, a ton of fun, and the most, probably the most amazing part is just um, having, like getting to see how what we do uh, touches people around the world. You know, we'll visit um, locations anywhere in the world and we'll hold uh, community <laughs> events. And it's just amazing to see how many people show up and they'll show up with their um, Warcraft 1 boxes and their, you know, Warcraft 2 boxes, Diablo. You know, they've been playing our games for years and years. and. Um, it's pretty amazing to, to see and, and feel that. That's not really answering your question. <laughs> but, let, but let's get back to, to then this thing of, of learning to be a businessman. Yeah. How, does, how did you go about this, and how did, how did it work out for, for you? It's sort of been, uh, yeah, I guess we've just kind of learned as, as we go, because we've kind of we've kind of had to. Um, we definitely had a mentality early on that we just wanted to focus on game development. And we, didn't, we kind of wanted to 
create the game, hand it off to sort of the machine, let them publish the thing. And then what we found is that nobody cared as much as we did. Um, little mistakes here and there. Um, I'll give you one example of sort of a quality assurance mistake that is sort of obvious, but, um, but happened. So um, when we did Warcraft 1, so it's our first Warcraft game, our first Blizzard uh, published, self-published game, we actually did a deal with Interplay, and Interplay published the game in France. Okay. Um, the game itself wasn't localized into French, but the manual was localized into French. But the problem was our copy protection was enter word five on page five of the manual. And so, and nobody tested the French version of the game with the Fr French manual, because it actually wasn't localized. So um, nobody could actually install the game. They couldn't get past copy protection. <laughs> and so from then on, Blizzard QA'd every single uh, language that we released of all of our games. So that's kind of how it kind of evolved, where um, things would happen that was like, oh my gosh, we'll just do it ourselves. And so we started um, really taking control of everything customer facing that touched the Blizzard brand. So including QA, including customer service, um, ultimately including marketing, including PR, like all of these things we gradually brought in house at Blizzard. Mm -hmm. and, and then let me ask you about some of the history of the mergers. So you, you're a businessman now and there are mergers that involves Blizzard. How did you learn this and navigate this? Well, I didn't really have to navigate any of the mer mergers, so to speak. Um, so, so what, what happened? So what are the, the way I navigated the mergers, the way that we navigated the mergers at Blizzard was to make sure that um, whatever happened sort of above us at the corporate level, the people that were um, running the company knew that um, Blizzard was something special. And uh, fortunately, we were able to build a really strong track record early on. Warcraft 1, Warcraft 2, um, Starcraft, Diablo, Warcraft 3, so really solid track record. Um, so I started the company in 94 with Alan and Frank. We sold the company uh, in 91 with Alan and Frank. In 94, we sold the company to Davidson and Associates. Um, and that's kind of where we lost control um, from a legal perspective. Um, but the deal was that um, they promised to give us complete um, autonomy and creative control, which probably everybody gets promised. We didn't know that. Um, but, uh, but we took that at, at their word, and we said, OK, they're going to leave us alone, let us make games. And so we did that, and we were very successful doing it. So we had a string of number one selling games by the time that the Davidsons sold their company to CUC International. When the CC guys came in, we had a meeting with them, and we said, hey, here's the deal. You leave us alone. We make great games. You make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and for the most part, that's what they did. And then CUC merged with HFS. They became Sendent. Sendent uh, had found that CUC wasn't keeping their accounting properly, and that there was a bunch of stuff that was uh, incorrect in there, and they ended up selling off the entire software business to a French company called Vivendi. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we just kind of, we felt the winning strategy for us was keep our heads down, continue focusing on the games, the quality of the games, make sure that our track record stayed pristine and that mm -hmm. the other stuff would fall in, in place. So that's, that's kind of, you know, we weren't really involved in, in that stuff very much. Mm -hmm. Where I was more involved was um, when, uh, so Vivendi Games, which we were part of, um, that also included Sierra. Some of you guys know Sierra. Um, and Knowledge Adventure. And the thing is, the Blizzard part of that business was consistently very profitable. And the Sierra part of the business was consistently very unprofitable. Um, and it kind of almost even lined up where they were losing all of our money. 
<laughs> and sometimes even more than that. And we just didn't feel like it was sustainable. At some point, we felt like Vivendi is going to actually not want to be in the software business. So we, we uh, looked around and we thought, OK, where would be a good place for Blizzard to land where we'll be able to keep our culture and our identity and continue focusing on you know, building what we have? And we identified Activision as a really good sort of marriage. Um, we felt like there was a tremendous amount of value we were building at Blizzard that was like trapped away and hidden within this big giant conglomerate. And we felt like it would be great if we could take Blizzard public, but we didn't want to be a standalone public company because we wanted the freedom to be able to um, push release dates when necessary. And that's kind of really hard to do as a standalone public company. But we felt like if we married a, a really successful, well-run, complementary uh, gaming business like Activision, which is really strong on console, and at the time they had Guitar Hero and like a bunch of stuff, um, as long as they wanted to do the merger for the right reasons, we thought that would be a great marriage. And so I met with Bobby Kodak, CEO of Activision. Um, we actually had dinner at a local Morton's in Irvine. Like, we probably met for three or four hours, and I just grilled him on every question I could think of, and you know, why do you want to do this, and what happens in this situation, and that situation, and he had a, you know, great answers, and he had a ton of respect for Blizzard. Mm -hmm. And so that was the one that the Blizzard leadership team was the most involved in, because we really encouraged Activision, um, sort of the Activision Blizzard partnership. Um, so just taking it back to UCLA here at the, near the end of my questions, so start to think about your questions. Um, what did you do at UCLA that was not in the lab? What did I do not in the lab? Um, stuff that's not class. Stuff that's not, well, OK. Um, so I lived um, for the first two years at a um, cooperative off campus called the Westwood Bayit. It's a Jewish cooperative. Mm -hmm. There were 16 of us that basically did everything, cooked, cleaned. Um, and so that was. Uh, that was a ton of fun. I joined Triangle Fraternity. Any triangles here? Yeah. Right <laughs> so I joined Triangle um, my first year. Um, and I uh, actually lived at the house for my, the last six months that I was here. In fact, um, that was a pretty, um, that was sort of like the beginnings of Blizzard really started while I was living in that house. And Alan Adham, um, lived in an apartment across the street. So I'd invite him over to parties at Triangle, and, uh, and we'd hang out a lot, mm -hmm. a lot together. Um, let's see, what else did I do? I studied a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a lot of late nights. Landfair is a really noisy street. So the Westwood Bight was actually 619 Landfair. And Triangle was 519 Landfair, so I spent a lot of time on Landfair. <laughs> um, and I spent a lot of time coming to campus and studying in the library, because mm. it's hard to study on Landfair. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any, any advice for, uh, for the UCLA students here of, of what, what should what do you recommend they do? And in particularly, if they want to go in the direction you have gone, what do you recommend that they think about? Um, yeah, I do have some advice. Um, I think one is, you know, you hear people say, if you don't know where you're going, how will you get there? You don't have enough information to know where you're going. I, I don't think you should feel any pressure or stress to have your life mapped out right now. Now is about um, learning and absorbing and exposing yourself to all sorts of different things so you can determine what you're interested in, what you're passionate about. That's the most important thing. Like learn, figure out what you are passionate about, and then devote yourself to getting really, really good at that. And all sorts of opportunities will open up that you couldn't possibly predict where you are now. Um, so I don't think you have to have things mapped out. You don't need to know all the answers. You don't need to know what you're going to be in 10 years. Um, I think it's impossible to know. It's sort of like studying for the final in the first week of class. <laughs> Good luck. I mean, you can spend a lot of time doing that, but I mean, you're kind of wasting your time, right? Um, so I think uh, that's probably the big best advice I can I can give you guys. You have so access to so much here, so just take advantage of it. You know, um, you will everything you learn 
um, right now at this stage of your life um, will kind of be a foundation that you can build on later. Thank you, thank you. I, I uh, thank you for answering my questions now. I have I want one to... more, one more piece of advice. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, um, when you go out and you do some, and you do the a new thing, you get a new job or you do whatever, um, it is going to be overwhelming because it's all new, and that's totally normal and natural. I can tell you when we first started Blizzard, um, my first project was um, uh, to, take this, uh, to take this art tool that Interplay used for the 8-bit Nintendo. They hired us to um, extend it out so it would work with the um, new Super Nintendo okay, that had just come out. And um, the thing is the program was a C++ program. I didn't know C++, never took any classes in C++. In fact, I only took one class in C. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was my project, and I just was completely overwhelmed. I didn't know where to start. Um, and at one point, I basically was like, I don't know what to do. And you know, my friend Alan, he said, hey, um, he'll teach me what I need to know. Remember, he said that. So I went into his office, and I'm like, Alan, I don't know if I, I don't think I can do this. And he said, he actually is, his um, answer is really, really valuable to me. He, um, he said, Mike, um, it's totally natural to feel overwhelmed when you're faced with a large project like this. Break it down into small, bite-sized pieces. Don't try to solve it all at once. And then he kind of sent me off. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of floored. I'm like, wait a minute. He's not going to help me. <laughs> but I did what he said. And I spent the whole night at the office. And I tried to break it down in tiny pieces. And I tried to like, pick a starting point and build from there. And that lesson has totally helped me. And um, just one sort of small uh, uh, additional story on that is um, we actually hired a friend of mine um, who was also a Triangle uh, brother from the fraternity, one of the smartest programmers that I knew while I was going here. Um, while he was still at school, we, he, um, we hired him to take um, battle chess um, that Interplay had written for the multimedia PC, which was before Windows, was DOS-based, um, and convert that over to Windows to get it running. The, and the, MP, the multimedia PC version was completely written in assembly language. Very difficult to port that to Windows. Um, and so Pat took on the project, and a few weeks in, he called me up and he said, Mike, this is way more complicated than I thought. I, I don't think I can do it. I want you to come and take the source code. I'm sorry that I wasted your time. And, I, and so I met him at the Triangle. He was living at the house at the time. And um, gave him the same exact speech Alan gave me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Pat, you're a really smart guy. I know you can do this. Um, just try to break it down into small bite-sized pieces. <laughs> don't try to solve it all at once. If you still can't do it, that's fine. I'll take the source code back. But don't give up yet. Just try. And, um, and he said, OK. And he did. And he completed that project. We ended up hiring him. He became our vice president of R&D. Um, he's a uh, you know, really accomplished uh, game maker now in his own right. But I, you, know, you guys are going to face a, a similar thing. I'm going to give you the same advice. <laughs> Seriously, it's totally natural to feel overwhelmed. Break it down in small pieces and don't try to solve it all at once. Very good. Thank you, thank you. Um, Now we have a microphone, and um, we have multiple microphones. And uh, if you could uh, line up to uh, just, you can stay where you are. That's even better. Uh, but raise your hand, and then a microphone will come to you. Good. So I will take uh, in order. So we start with this gentleman here uh, to your left. Hi. <coughs> Hello, Michael. Hi. This is Michael Wang. And very glad to be here. Uh, uh, first, I want to tell you just uh, Blizzard has inspired me since I was very young. And because my first game played when I was in elementary, elementary school, uh, when I was in China, uh, at that time, StarCraft was like an English version. Yeah. And I played that uh, without any knowledge of English, <laughs> just by graphics. 
That's and, awesome. And from that time, my, my first sentence I learned in English was, show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I believe that the second one was Black Sheep Wall. <laughs> and, and, and after that, uh, when I was in middle school, and every, every classmates, I mean the, the boys, the, they play Warcraft. And now I'm in UCLA. I'm a double E student, uh, undergrad. And I play Overwatch and uh, Hearthstone. And I'm a legendary player in All right. uh, Hearthstone. <laughs> so yeah, I have a question. question? Yeah. Uh, before this event, I didn't know you was uh, Double E student. I saw you are computer science student. So as a double E student, just want to ask you a question about like as a double E student, like what's what's your advice besides the beat wise to to go to the Blizzard? <laughs> uh, I mean work for you. <laughs> yeah, we don't do a ton of electrical engineering at Blizzard. We're a software company. So um, my advice would be uh, Learn programming. <laughs> um, gentleman over here. So you. Hi, Mike. Hi. Uh, I'm Unshul. I had a real quick question for you. You know, starting off Blizzard must have been super hard. And we heard pitches from some students earlier tonight. I was wondering, when you were just starting off with Blizzard, what was your pitch? The pitch um, for if when we were trying to pitch Blizzard, or? Um, so I, you know, Alan really handled the business side of things. Um, I, I didn't, I wasn't really, I wasn't qualified to sell anything. <laughs> um, I, was, I was just sort of in front of the computer programming. I was also, sort of, we, we wore a lot of hats. There were only three, three of us in the beginning and gradually grew from there. And so I was sort of like, um, in addition to being a programmer, I also kind of handled the back office, like IT, um, which would really meant driving to Micro Center or CompUSA and buying a computer and then setting it up for somebody. Um, so yeah, um, Alan was the guy going out and meeting with the companies and getting a, and lining up work for us. I think we have some questions up in the back here. Yep. Could you raise your hand again? Uh, yep. Hi, um, I know recently you guys made StarCraft II free to play, and I was wondering what, what led to that decision. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I was just wondering what led to that decision because I know a lot of fans are pretty upset about it. I don't think they should be upset about, it, but anyways, yeah. I don't think a lot of them are upset about it. A few of them don't read very well. Um, so um, basically, StarCraft II is made up of. Um, Wings of Liberty, which is the, the first original campaign, and two uh, expansion campaigns, Heart of the Swarm and Legacy of the Void. Um, the best, so what we wanted to do is really lower all the barriers to new StarCraft players coming in. Um, we uh, wanted people, you know, Le Wings of Liberty has been out for seven years now. So um, we wanted to basically get people um, who are interested in StarCraft, lower the barriers. If they want to play Wings of Liberty, let them just play the whole thing for free, and hopefully they will want to upgrade um, and get Heart of the Swarm and Legacy of the Void later. The other thing with StarCraft is um, fragmenting multiplayer really doesn't make any sense. We want the entire community playing with the same units on the same ladder, and so we wanted to expose multiplayer to the entire community and get rid of all the barriers to that too. And so. There are other things. All the recent content that we're adding, um, you know, Legacy of the Void, you don't get for free. Um, the uh, co-op commanders, we're letting you have them up to level five, but after that, you still have to uh, earn or purchase them. So, I mean, there's still a lot of content in the game. I think the biggest issue with StarCraft is there was already a lot of that game that was free. How many knew that? How many didn't know that? How many don't care? Okay. <laughs> There's one. You should play StarCraft, whoever you are. Um, but yeah, I think that this was really an, our attempt to rebrand the game, lower the barriers, and get people playing it. We already had a huge chunk of the game that was already free, but nobody really knew that. And so it wasn't succeeding as being a 
acquisition tool at bringing people into the game. And so this is an effort to really streamline the messaging and um, uh, lower, increase the accessibility and hopefully get more people playing what is really an awesome game. Uh, question over, uh, we start here. Yes. Hi, yes, John, <clears throat> Jonathan Sherwood, MBA candidate at UCLA Anderson. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak to both who and how will the distribution of esports content be monetized? Who and how? Uh, well, I guess I mean I can talk about uh, Overwatch League because that's our most recent um, uh, initiative, and I think that's the one where um, we're really trying to take a page out of um, traditional sports, which does a very good job um, of running, you know, their sports le sports leagues and teams as real businesses. Um, and I think we view the, the opportunities and the, the revenue opportunities to be sort of very similar to that. Um, in Overwatch League, you will have um, city-based teams that will have local venues, um, local sponsorships, um, and uh, local t you know, ticket sales for their venues. So you'll have teams traveling around playing home and away games just like you do with traditional sports. So I think there's a much better opportunity for the um, sports esports team owners to be able to build, build a business around their team. I think that's very important. And then I think that as you grow um, viewership, there's opportunities just like with, with traditional sports leagues in terms of media right sales and distribution. And I think your distribution partners can also help um, promote the, the league and, and the events and uh, expose them to a wider audience. Let's take a question here, right next to... Oh, well, actually, the, we have one from the youngest member of oh, the we, audience. We must, you, we yeah. must uh, take a question from the youngest member. Hi, I'm Brady. I wanted to know, what was your dream job as a child? Uh, <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, you know, probably early on, I probably wanted to go to the moon um, as an <laughs> astronaut. And then I realized I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> so um, not as appealing to me anymore. Um, you know... Gosh, that's such a good question. Because I remember in high school, um, I remember going to, and looking at the job board. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I looked at all the different types of things you could do. And I remember seeing electrical engineer and just being really intrigued. Because it's like, I didn't know what that did. But it sounded so interesting. And electrical engineers know how everything works. So. Um, but I don't know. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. Um, and now that I'm in the games industry, I don't, I don't know what else I, like what else could be more fun than making things that make other people, that entertain other people, and bring people together. So um, I think I've got a pretty great job. Let's take a question here. Hey Mike, my name is Matt. Um, I've been playing World of Warcraft since I was like nine years old, probably. Quit shortly after like Cataclysm was announced. Recently at BlizzCon, you guys announced that you'd be releasing Classic WoW, obviously, which is like kind of your baby, I guess you could call it. Uh, how excited are you for that, and what kind of decisions led you to actually make that decision? Well, so um, the WoW community has been um, very clear about their desire for um, classic servers for a while. Um, really, the only thing that has stopped us from doing it is trying to figure out how to feasibly do it and do it in a way that felt Blizzard quality. Um, and so the team has really been hard at work trying to figure out um, if we were going to do it, how would we do it, how would we maintain it um, in a way that's uh, really sustainable. And um, they had a breakthrough this past year where they um, solved some of the difficult problems that they were coming up against. And um, I think once they did that, we were very excited about, um, especially about announcing it to the community. But, um, but now I think that it's just really cool to have that option for people that want to kind of go back and experience World of Warcraft um, like it was. Uh, question here, down here in the middle. Uh, yeah. When did you realize that uh, everyone was talking about Blizzard the first time? Uh, I'm not sure everybody's talking about <laughs> Blizzard. <laughs> but um, 
there have definitely been uh, some moments along the way that have been um, really amazing. Um, the, the one that just really comes to mind is uh, the launch of World of Warcraft, um, which completely uh, blew us away in terms of the response to the game. Um, you know, whenever you hold an event, like we held a midnight opening at, in Fountain Valley at Fry's Electronics, and um, you know, midnight. Whenever you hold an event like that, you don't know how many people are gonna, you know, show up to buy boxes and get their boxes signed. And I just remember very distinctly uh, driving up the 405 to get off the exit, and the exit was backed up with traffic. I was like, oh shoot, there's another event going on <laughs> the same time as ours. Um, and then, you know, we, I got off the freeway and there's just crowds and crowds of people walking towards Fry's um, because you couldn't park. The Fry's parking lot had filled up. People were parking blocks away and walking to Fry's. The line wrapped around uh, the building three times before going down the street. And, um, and actually, they sold out of boxes at Fry's. We had to send somebody back to the office to get the boxes that were intended for employee copies and try to you know, bring them back. And there are still some people that didn't get boxes. And that was just like the first sign that this is going to be really big. We have another question uh, over here. Yes. Uh, my question is about a former employee of Microsoft, Chris Mason. Chris Mason. Yeah, I he's know. been talking about World of Warcraft in BlizzCon for many years. And I know he's, um, one of the he was one of the chief designers of World of Warcraft, right? I want to know what role has Chris, play has Chris been playing in the deve development of all these extraordinary games? And the furthermore question is about the relationship between engineers and the game designers. How do they cooperate in Blizzard? Does it happen that the game designer came up with an idea and said, would it be cool if we do this? And the engineer said, no, we can't do that. That happens all the time. <laughs> um, OK, well, so Chris Metzen um, is one of our, um, he's really sort of the guy who brought story, uh, backstory to, to Blizzard universe design. Um, he was originally hired as an artist, uh, I believe, uh, way back in the day. And then he actually wrote um, some backstory that was used in the manual for Warcraft, one of the Warcraft games. I think it was maybe even Warcraft 1. Um, and uh, he, he was sort of our world builder, world, world designer. Um, uh, Chris actually re retired from games last year, and so um, you know we're still very good friends friends with him, um, but um, but now we're sort of carrying the torch for him. We have a question right uh, there. One more, one more question. Oh, that's a, one more question. I wanted to give it to this gentleman here. Um, so recently, you decided to let Destiny Three onto your platform. You've actually never made a decision like that. Uh, I just wanted to understand some of the thinking behind that, especially when it pulls a lot of uh, gamer base from Overwatch. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, we knew that um, Bungie wanted to bring Destiny, Destiny 2, um, uh, to, they wanted to bring it to PC. And, um, and so we had a decision to make whether to, uh, you know, uh, offer to have it on the Battle.net platform or not. And I think that, the thing that really convinced us that we wanted to put it on the platform, we sort of felt like we have, have always had a lot of respect for Bungie as a, as a game developer. Um, we uh, really liked Destiny, uh, the first one. Um, we knew Destiny 2 was going to be a really great game. And um, we kind of tr asked ourselves whether uh, Blizzard gamers would want to have the ability to play Destiny on the Battle.net platform. And we felt like they would. So the next step was to really work with Bungie to attack uh, some of the feasibility questions about what, what it would take to do it. But once we convinced ourselves that it was feasible and um, that there was a desire on both Blizzard and Bungie's part, and Activision's part too, uh, Activision's the publisher, that, uh, that it was worth doing. So that's how it happened. Well, 
great to end on a positive note. Thank you, thank you very much. Yep. Well, thank you both. That was fascinating, uh, terrific conversation. And it's clear that we've got an audience that's deeply invested in gaming and Blizzard and has deep knowledge. I was quite blown away by the detail in some of your questions. Um, so thank you. That was truly wonderful. Thank you. I do want to announce that the next uh, talk in the speaker series is going to be by Henry Samueli, who, as you all know, uh, is the person that named our school. And that's another wonderful uh, story of self-invention and uh, building another big corporation. And so there's going to be some really good insights that come from that. Uh, that's going to happen January 17th, and I hope to see you all there. Uh, and now we've got a reception right outside. Uh, I believe there is food, is that right? Yeah, pizza, all right, okay. And so, um, so I hope to see you guys outside. Uh, I believe there are representatives from Blizzard uh, to talk to prospective students uh, or prospective employers, employees, I should say, I guess. Uh, so we'll see you outside, all right? Thank you so much. And, and go Bruins.